This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Hey there, everyone. This is episode number 27 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Brian. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. If you are new to this podcast, welcome. I am glad that you are here. And uh, if you have been listening for a while, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, join us on the homestead journey, that journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. I am living a very, very blessed life In spite of COVID-19, there are some wonderful things happening here on our homestead. And so let's jump right into it. There are just a lot of wonderful things that are happening here on the homestead. I absolutely love this time of year. Spring is my favorite time of the year on the homestead. Um, I just really, really love so much about it. And in fact, today we actually took a little bit of a drive to get out of the house, you know, kind of get away from some of this cabin fever. And as we were driving along, my son actually said to me, you know, dad, I just absolutely love spring. It's just such a bummer that it seems like it's so short and then it's over. And, you know, he's right. (laughs) You know, it seems like uh, winter lasts forever. Summer is fairly long. Fall kind of drags on until you get that first snowstorm. And spring is over, bam, in the blink of an eye. But again, really, really enjoying the things that we have going on here on the homestead. This week was a bit of a crappy week. (laughs) And I mean that literally. Um, this week we, uh, did the spring clean out of, um, some of the pig pen area. I use, uh, a deep mulch system or deep litter method, I guess, um, in part of my pig area because during the winter I keep the, and it's just for ease of man- management, um, I try to keep the, the pigs up as close to the house as possible. So I'm not having to cart water quite as far. And so there is a lot of manure buildup um, at the, you know, kind of the edge of where their winter housing is. And so I, uh, you know, I keep putting in wood chips all winter long. And then in the spring, I clean that out. And so this week was the week that I did that. Uh, My son and I also cleaned out our winter chicken run. So we have a hoop coop that we have next to our main chicken coop that we, um, you know, allow the chickens access to during the winter because our chickens are a little bit (laughs) hoity-toity. They have never really liked the snow. Not a, not a single flock that we've had until this year. This group of chickens did go out into the snow a little bit this year. Um, but many times our chickens just simply refuse to go out of the coop into the snow. And so we give them access to the uh, hoop coop that has a a tarp over it. It's actually a rabbitry. We keep our rabbits in there as well. And so they have access to that all winter long. And again, we keep putting wood chips in that all winter. And then we clean it out in the spring. And so we did that this week. And then we also did our main, we, we cleaned out our main chicken coop. And again, we use the deep litter method there. We actually use pine shavings in that coop and we clean it out once a year and it never smells. Um, You start seeing a little bit of a buildup or get a little bit of an odor and you add more wood chips or well, wood shavings. That was the crappy part of the week. But honestly, folks, it wasn't that bad because while I did the pig pen pretty much by myself, the chicken run and the chicken coop clean out was done with my son. And it's just a great time working with him. I absolutely enjoy working with him doing chores around the homestead. And so it was just a great opportunity for me to spend time with him. And uh, we had a good time, even though it was a crappy situation. Uh, I also spent some time this weekend putting in some more seeds in the square foot garden beds, uh, 
some of the more cold hardy crops. I planted a little bit of kale and some Swiss chard and some more spinach. So we'll see. I think a, a few more carrots I planted this week. So we'll, we'll see how things go there. Nothing has germinated yet, but it has been rarely or fairly chilly. Uh, we did have a 60 degree day today. We had snow yesterday. Mother nature is psychotic, um, but it does feel good to have some more seeds in the ground. Chick update. The standard breed uh, chicks and our meat birds and turkeys are all doing really, really well. Um, the meat birds are growing like gangbusters, and so we have instituted the 12 on, 12 off uh, feeding regiment um, with the Cornish cross. Once they get to about two to three weeks, you want to give them access to food for 12 hours, generally during the day, and then during the evening, you take the feed away. Otherwise, those little knuckleheads would eat themselves literally to death. And so that's part of the way that you kind of slow their growth rates down a little bit so that they're not having broken legs and heart attacks is by restricting access to the feed. One of the things, though, to keep in mind is when you go to give them the feed back in the morning, they are like monsters. Um, they just are crazed. Uh, they want at that feed and so you just need to be very careful that you kind of sweep them off to the side a little bit and set the, if you're setting a feeder into their area. Um, I learned the hard way, unfortunately, one time where I crushed a couple of chicks setting the feeders into the brooder and uh, actually had some chicks get trapped underneath there. So uh, keep that in mind. But 12 on, 12 off for meat birds is the way to go when you get to that two to three week range. We also had, and you may hear them right now, it's, you might hear that grinding noise in the background. Um, that's uh, an egg turner in an incubator. But we had start hatching yesterday, the chicks that we had in our small incubator. And uh, I put some pictures up on our Instagram page and our Facebook page. And I think maybe even a video of the chicks that are hatching out. And in that incubator, we had seven eggs. And I can now report to you that as of tonight, all seven chicks have hatched. We just had the last one hatch not too long ago. So we're going to leave them in the incubator for about 24 hours. That'll allow them to dry out, get all fluffy and nice. And then we will move them to a brooder. That's the chick update here. Um, very exciting to have those seven barnyard crosses hatch out here on our homestead. And we're looking forward to seeing what we get with the goose eggs, the duck eggs, and the chicken eggs that are in the larger incubator. Another big thing that we accomplished here on our homestead this week is I installed drip irrigation on our raised beds. Something I've been wanting to do for a long time and I finally decided that this was the year. And in part, this goes back to what we talked about last week, but I want to maximize my food production this year. And one of the big holes that we had in our raised beds, and anybody that's worked with raised beds know that they do have a tendency to dry out a little more quickly than an in-ground garden would. Um, but it's always been a bit of a challenge in part because of where the garden is located, but just the sheer size of it to water it consistently uh, and to water it well. And I've, I've tried, I tried the Mel Bartholomew heated uh, five gallon buckets and you, you water each square individually. Uh, when I only had a few beds and even still at that point, it was very time consuming to do that. Uh, then I started using the sprinklers, but once you start getting crops that are growing up, they start blocking that, your leaves are getting wet, you have problems with powdery mildew and blight, and it's just not an even water. And not only that, but you're wasting water on paths and you're wasting water on your grass and you're having to move your sprinkler around and it just doesn't work very well. So all of that to say, I bought a drip irrigation kit from Drip Depot and uh, installed it and it went together very well. Although my fingers are still very sore today 
<laughs> from putting all of that compression fittings together. But by and large, I was very happy with how it went together. Um, I've got it out on the beds. And so I, I do need to go through and put the clips that will hold the drip line in place a little bit better than, um, than what it is now. But uh, we'll see how things go. Um, very excited to see if that makes a difference. Another big thing that happened this week. I am excited to share this with you. And that is that we actually now have a website. www.thehomesteadjourney.net is the domain name now for this podcast. It's something that I've been wanting to put in place. I've been actually working on this website uh, since I think November on and off as I had a little bit of time. Now, it's not anything mind-blowing yet. Um, hopefully in the future we'll be able to develop it out. But right now, all of the show notes from this podcast will be available there at www.thehomesteadjourney.net. Um, we also have some of the items that we have for sale from our farm uh, there. And that right now would be things like turkeys and pigs, things along those lines. In the future, I'm thinking I, I want to put out some merch uh, for the podcast and for the farm, and those will also be available for sale there, but we're not there yet. Um, also on uh, the website are updates as far as what's going on on the farm. Um, so it's just uh, you know a little bit more information, a little different way to present it. And uh, again, we'll be building this out uh, over the next uh, few uh, weeks, months, and, and we'll see where it takes us. In part, I wanted to do this as well because hopefully this will help people discover this podcast um, a little bit better. But uh, again, check it out, www.thehomesteadjourney.net. And so with that, we now have an fish official email uh, address for this podcast. So brian at thehomesteadjourney.net is our new email address. The old email address, the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com will still work, but start using brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. That will probably be the better route to go. And it definitely is easier to spell, I think, than the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com. This week, also, we reached a huge milestone on this podcast, and that is that we reached 7,000 downloads. So thank you very much for being a part of that. Thank you very much for sharing this podcast with your friends, um, with your family, with people that you think might be helped by it, uh, maybe even your enemies. I don't know, but you have helped us reach that milestone of 7,000 downloads. And so very, very humbled and very, very grateful for that. Thank you very much. And then finally, um, and this is probably the thing that I am the most excited to share with you. This week, I was honored to be interviewed by Harold Thornborough over at the Modern Homesteading podcast. And in fact, he released that episode tonight, uh, April 19th, 2020. Um, and I will go ahead and link to that episode in the, uh, in the show notes. Um, but you probably are already aware of the Modern Homesteading podcast. It's a podcast uh, that's been around for a while, although we did take a bit of a hiatus towards the end of last year. But uh, Harold Thornborough is somebody who I really um, admire. And when he reached out to me about um, whether or not I'd be interested in uh, appearing on his podcast, um, I have to admit I got a little bit giddy. Um, and I, I didn't quite sleep well that night um, because I was so excited and very honored um, that somebody like him, who I admire greatly, um, would would be interested in chatting with me about homesteading. Um, Harold Thornborough is somebody who really lives out a lot of what I talk about here on the podcast from the standpoint of my strong belief that if you want to live this lifestyle, you can regardless of of where you live. And if you listen to his podcast, you read his blog, you read his book, you will understand that he is somebody who is doing a lot of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability on a suburban lot. 
And I don't remember exactly what the dimensions are now because I, I believe he recently bought the lot next door. But at one point, I think he was less, he was under a quarter of an acre. And yet he was still doing a lot of things from the standpoint of raising and growing his own food and, and all of those kinds of things. So anyhow, I was so honored to talk to him. And uh, I mean, it was one of those things that, bam, time flew by uh, so quickly. And uh, the next thing I knew, it was like an hour and a half later. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you poor guy, you're going to have to edit this down to something manageable. So um, hopefully I was coherent. But uh, it really was a great honor to uh, to talk to him. And so, again, I'll link to that uh, episode on in the show notes. Um, and I will also be providing links on all of our social media uh, accounts. So, wow, that's what's been going on on our homestead this week. A lot of stuff. I barely scratched the surface. But anyhow, great week here on 3B Farm and Homestead. And I'm so excited to share it with you. All right, let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. Today, we're going to spend some time talking about one of my least favorite activities on our homestead. Now, I know that's a great way to lead into a topic. It really makes you want to listen, doesn't it? (laughs) Record keeping. Record keeping is something that I can find a lot of creative ways to kind of push off and not do, even though I know it's good for me, it's good for our homestead, but I just don't enjoy it at all. There are some people I know who thrive on it, and and maybe not necessarily on keeping all of the records that I'm going to be talking about today, but there are people who have kept a diary for years and who journal and all of those kinds of things. And I, at times, have really envied people like that, and I have tried to do things like that, and I just have never found success. And I just think I've come to the realization that that's just not my jam. But having said that, I think there are certain records, certain things that we should keep track of on our homestead. I think there's a lot of benefit to keeping records about certain things. And so today, let's talk about some of the areas that you might want to track on your homestead, some of the records you might want to keep, and why I think those things are important. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is keeping track of our finances, the money that we are putting into our homesteading activities. And I think this is very beneficial for a number of reasons. First of all, if you are wanting to potentially start selling products off of your homestead, it's very important to know how much it costs you to produce those products to make sure that you're at least breaking even and hopefully (laughs) making a profit on whatever it is that you are going to sell. When I first started raising chickens, I didn't keep track of how much it cost me. And a big part of that is because I was taking over from my grandfather. My grandfather had raised chickens for years and years and years. It was just a way of life. And so I just kind of took over where he had been, what he had been doing. And that simply meant that in the spring, I ordered chicks. When the chicks came, I made sure I had feed. When the feed ran out, I went and bought more feed And that was kind of just our approach to raising chickens. We didn't keep track of how much it cost us. It was just a part of what we did. And then a friend of ours asked us to raise them some chicken. And so that was the first time that I ever kept detailed records with regards to how much money I was putting into chickens. And I've shared this story with you before, but suffice it to say, it was an eye-opening experience. It cost me a lot more money than I thought it did to raise chickens. And I realized that that approach, raising standard breed chickens for meat, certainly was not something that made a whole lot of financial sense if I wanted to raise chickens to sell. So when I decided to raise Cornish Cross meat birds, again, I made sure that I kept detailed records of my inputs how much it cost me to get the chicks, all of those kinds of things, so that if I decided 
that I wanted to try to market chickens to people, I would know not just what my break-even point was, but what I needed to sell the chicken for in order to achieve a profit. So keeping track of your finances, keeping good financial records is going to be very beneficial for you if you are wanting to use your homestead to generate some kind of an income, whether it's chicken or pork, or maybe you want to sell soap or honey or whatever it is, keeping good financial records simply makes good business sense so that you know how much things are costing you to produce and you know how much that you should sell them for to realize a profit. Keeping good financial records can also have tax benefits. Now, I want to qualify this by saying I'm not a CPA, I'm not a financial planner, so you definitely want to check with somebody more knowledgeable than me, particularly as it relates to your area, as tax laws vary from place to place. But you may be able to achieve some tax benefits, some tax write-offs, maybe a tax break on your property. Again, it just varies from place to place, but the only way you're going to be able to realize that is if you keep good, detailed financial records. So definitely check with your accountant, your CPA, whoever it is that you use with regards to your taxes, get some information, maybe do some Googling, but I do know that you at times can achieve certain tax benefits by keeping good financial records. But beyond that, it just simply makes good sense to keep track of what we're spending our money on. You can spend a lot of money doing the homesteading thing and not realize it. It's very easy uh, to, you know, oh, I need this tool. I go out and ru- I run out and buy it. Oh, I need feed for the chickens. I run out and buy it. Oh, I need potting soil to start my plants. I run out and buy it. And n- the next thing you know, you have spent a lot of money and maybe you're spending outside your means. So keeping good financial records is very, very important. The second type of records I think that it's important to keep And that is to keep good records with regards to the animals that you have on your homestead. As you know, we raise American guinea hogs here on our homestead. We have registered American guinea hogs on our homestead. And so I need to make sure that I keep very good detailed records about the litters that I have because that's very important for registration purposes. We need to know who the mommy is. We need to know who the daddy is (laughs) because we want to have accurate records in the herd book. But it's not even just about the registration of the pigs. I also want to keep good records about the pigs to find out are there any kind of abnormalities that keep showing up. Maybe I need to get rid of my boar because maybe there's some kind of an abnormality that keeps showing up in the piglets on a consistent basis. Or maybe I have a particular sow that isn't being a good mother. Maybe she started out great. She was dropping good litters. And now all of a sudden, instead of eight or 10 piglets surviving, one or two piglets are surviving. So keeping good records for my pigs in that regard is also very beneficial. But then the other thing as well is it also helps me with regards to evaluating the piglets that I have to figure out whether or not I want to register this piglet or not register that piglet. So you can look at maybe the growth rates. You can look at the number of teats. You can look at, uh, you know, right from the, the first time that I evaluate a piglet, what's its personality? Is it chill? Is it more excitable? Um, And I can keep good records about these pigs so that when it comes time to make a decision as to whether or not it's going to be a breeder or a feeder, I have good records to back up my decision-making process. Now, obviously, the type of animal that you're raising and what you're doing with those animals is going to help you determine what level of record-keeping you need to undertake. I mean, for example, if you're raising quail and you're just wanting them for eggs and meat, you're probably not going to keep detailed records of every quail that you have. 
But on the other hand, if you are wanting to develop a particular characteristic, maybe it's a color of, of egg or um, maybe it's a, a particular body size. And I know Jack Diddley about quail, so perhaps this is a bad example. But you know what I'm saying. If you're doing something like that, you're, you're trying to breed for a particular trait, then you would keep different records than if you're just breeding for meat and eggs. But keeping detailed animal records, I think, can be an important thing on your homestead. The third type of record that I think can be very helpful in keeping is keeping good records with regards to your garden. Now, this is something that I have attempted to do for many, many years, and I have failed very miserably at it. And that's why I'm using GrowVeg.com. Again, I'm not sponsored by them, but I'm really enjoying that software because it's helping me develop a database, a record keeping system so that I know what I planted in a particular area. I know when I planted that vegetable. I know when I should expect a harvest. Keeping good records of your garden will help you remember and my forgetter is really good. <laughs> it will help you remember what you've had planted in er various areas within your garden, which will help you move crops around. And there's a lot of benefits to doing that. Number one, certain varieties or certain things are heavy feeders of a particular nutrient. And so if you keep planting the same crop in the same area over and over and over again, you can deplete your soil of the nutrients that that crop needs. But then another thing that happens is that there are certain blights and, and funguses and, and diseases and pests that will live in the soil. And if you keep planting in that same area over and over and over again with the same crop or a related crop, then you can continue to have those blights and those pest problems over and over and over again, where if you rotate the crops around, you can break those cycles and then you're going to achieve a better harvest. So keeping good records with regards to how you garden and, and where you're planting things can be very, very beneficial in a number of ways. So another area you might want to keep good records is in how you preserve your harvest. So for example, if you do a lot of canning, what did you can? How much did you can? My grandparents actually kept track of that on a note card that they kept in a photo album that they used to keep their recipes, their canning recipes. And I still actually have those. Now, I'm not suggesting that you keep canning records so that you could pass them on to future generations. <laughs> I mean, it's a very nice thing for me to have. It's something that I, I love having around, but that's not my reason for <laughs> suggesting that you keep good canning records. Rather, it's because, you know, if you canned 15 jars of pickles and at the end of the year you have 14 jars, then maybe you might not need to can pickles this year. Maybe you tried a new recipe. Uh, maybe it's a, a different approach to salsa or it's a new pickle and you find that you don't like that. So then you can kind of on your record say, hey, this wasn't that great. And then you don't use that same recipe again. So there's just a lot of reasons why you might want to consider keeping good canning records. Beyond that, there's just a sense of accomplishment where you can look back and say, hey, I canned 250 jars this year. That's up from last year when I canned 200, which is up from the year before when I canned 100, which is up from, you know, so it just helps you keep track of your progress on your homestead. You may want to do that with regards to what you freeze, what you dehydrate. Um, all of those food preservation techniques, I think, can benefit from a little bit of record keeping so that you know what you might want to consider doing this year. And that kind of leads us into the last aspect of record keeping that we're going to talk about today. And that is pantry and freezer record keeping or management. Now, this can benefit you in a number of different ways. First of all, it can keep you from running out of staples. So let's say you keep an extra bag of flour on hand and you open up that flour and you start using it and you forget to put it on your list and when you get to the end of that flour and you're in the middle of baking a pie or baking bread and you realize, oh my goodness, I'm out of flour. Now, particularly right now, as we are in 2020 and flour at 
times has been scarce because of this whole COVID thing, um, that can be a bigger issue than, well, it has been in the past. Sometimes it's just been a minor inconvenience. Oh, I got to run to the grocery store. Now for us, that's five minutes away. For some people though, that might be an hour round trip to get a bag of flour. And so keeping good records with regards to what's in your pantry, what you've used, um, certainly can keep you from running out of staples. But not only will it keep you from running out of staples, it will also help you keep from unnecessarily purchasing or producing things that you already have an abundance of in your freezer or in your pantry. So for example, if you have, you know, 15 cans of tomato sauce in your in your pantry, Maybe you don't need to buy a 16th, unless you go through a lot of tomato sauce. Let's use meat birds as an example. Let's say last year you raised 50 meat birds because you were anticipating using one a week, but instead you've used one every other week and you still have 25 meat birds in your freezer. So it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for you to raise another 50 meat birds this year. Maybe you can cut back to 25. Uh, Several years ago, I was making lots and lots and lots of pickles. I love to make pickles. I enjoy eating pickles. But what I found is that my family doesn't really enjoy eating pickles as much as I enjoy eating pickles. And we certainly don't enjoy eating pickles as much as I enjoy making pickles. And so what we were finding is we were having an accumulation of pickles in our pantry that just weren't getting eaten up. And so for the last several years, I have not made a single pickle. So again, good pantry and freezer inventory and management is going to help you know what you should produce on your homestead this year, what you should purchase at the store to make sure that you have enough, but that you aren't wasting money on things that might go bad, that might spoil um, because you just aren't using them. Well, I know this certainly isn't the sexiest, the funnest topic (laughs) to cover. I do think that this is something that is very, very beneficial for homesteads. What records do you keep that I didn't think about? What are some records that I should be thinking about keeping on my homestead? I'm certainly sure this isn't a comprehensive list. And so if I've missed something that you think is important, let me know. Uh, Send me an email or contact us on our social media sites. I would love to hear your feedback, and uh, if there's a way that I can improve my homestead record keeping, I certainly would love to do it, even though I really don't love to do it, if you know what I'm saying.